Welcome to Business and Investing with Grant and oh, it's always weird talking about myself in the third person, Charlie, where we are enhancing your complete set of skills to build wealth inside and outside your business. Charlie, quick question. Number one email list that you are on, go. Not ours. <laughs> it's not meant to be an alley-oop. Like, you meant to dunk it. I, I don't lie and I have a high ethical integrity. I'm not going to tell the people this is the best newsletter if I don't believe it. I believe it. Although, I believe it. please get on the newsletter. All the uh, What a setup, right? People will be itching to get on the newsletter after that setup. Although <laughs> I will right. say all the promotion we have been doing has made a difference. Like our list is growing substantially and I appreciate massively all the replies we have been getting. So for those of you that are on the list, a big thank you. It's nice to hear from you. If you're on the list and you want to say hi, hit reply. Um, and yeah, we can dig into it. I love it. Head over to businessandinvesting.com forward slash a newsletter, put in your details, and we will send out some awesome emails. Now, before we get into this episode, let's cue uh, the disclaimer. It's Charlie here from Business and Investing, and I need to let you know that Grant, myself, and the Business and Investing team are in no way, shape, or form qualified to give you personal or specific financial advice. We strongly encourage you seek out and use professionals when you are making investment decisions or comparing investment products. Can you feel that weather change, Grant? Did you notice like you're probably wearing a t-shirt a little bit more often? People are, are a little bit more joyous. Have you have you seen some of the festivities start to kick in in your area? They have put the Christmas bubbles and star up on South Banks Bridge. It is formally Christmas season, Charlie. It's near the end of the year. I've even seen some Christmas lights. Oh. <sighs> Jack's ecstatic. A, a little bit. I, I tell you what, he enjoyed Halloween of all things. I mean, he was born on Halloween, so it makes sense that he's kind of in line with that. <clears throat> but a lot of people made like ghosts and put pumpkins out. He thought it was awesome. So I'm hoping he'll enjoy Christmas in, in the same way. But to the point, right, we get to this time of year where the weather starts to change, people, uh, their moods start to change. And I, I like to use that personally as a bit of a signal that it's time to reflect and get perspective on the year. Like these are the signs that the year is coming to a conclusion and it's time to start really thinking about what's happened and how it's gone versus maybe the ambitions I had. So I've always been a big fan of taking time to reflect and get perspective. Is it something you've done often yourself? Heaps, heaps. Uh, to the extent like I usually try and review what I do in each day to say how am I progressing to my goals. But I usually take the end of the year to make a bigger one because why not? I think that the New Year's is a great stake in the ground to actually propel you into what do you plan on not doing next? I just think it's, I don't know. So to, use, to your point, it's a joyous time to actually look back and say, what have I done? Give yourself a pat on the back. Do you ever remember there used to be, uh, I think it was a TV show where they would say something and they would say like overrated and underrated. <laughs> Did you ever see that? Wow, you watched some great TV, Charlie. <laughs> well, I'm going to put it out there. I'm going to use the same thing here. I think goal setting is overrated. I think reflecting and doing a review of your year, underrated. Because I think Fair. the lessons and adaptions are in the review, not in the goal setting. I concur. I think it's not as sexy. Though I think that's why people gravitate towards it. But also, you, if you don't do it, you don't realize how much you have missed on the goals you wanted to achieve. Like it's like if I if I don't if I don't see you, you're not there, kind of thing. Okay, we've all done it. You tell me you haven't actually like had a year where you like set their really ambitious goals. Like you know, like I don't know, maybe watched a little bit too much Tony Robbins. Go there. I'm gonna be a billionaire by the end of this year. And um, you you coming into the year and like you get to the end of Q1, and it's like. Dude, We're I, not on track here. And then you start to ignore it. <laughs> I can tell you. So I was living in the Philippines at the time and it was Christmas and we went away to this hotel, my wife and I, Hazel, and I'm like, cool, I'm just going to reflect on like the year that was. <laughs> and I pulled it, pulled out the list of goals. It, like I was, had the coffee by myself and I had the like the view of the beach and everything by myself. And I'm like, well, I achieved none of that. And I just ended up sitting there. <laughs> Like I just didn't, I just didn't look at it. I'm just like, oh, that was just trash. <laughs> just that was like, never again. Just poof, paper's gone, and I just sat there drinking a coffee. 
That was, that was my reflection. <laughs> Amazing. That is so good. Anyway, yeah. if you haven't picked up by uh, tuning into this episode so far, Grant and I wanted to make an episode focused on reviewing uh, our investments and also business. But when we started to discuss it, there was just too much. So we're actually going to break this into two episodes. So this one, we're going to do year in review purely from an investment point of view. And in the, I'll say one of the upcoming ones that may or may be not be the next one, we're going to do it for business as well. Um, because I think sharing these insights might be helpful to the audience from our perspective as well. I'll also mention um, we both avidly set goals and do that even though we've kind of all just shit on goal setting at the start of this already. <laughs> so let's do the review and we might do a goal episode in January at some time. So we've got a list of questions. We're going to go back and forth. It should be a bit of fun. I think this is going to be a fun episode. So I'll kick this one off, Grant, and go um, – Purely, right, from a numerical point of view, so giving your year from an investing point of view a score out of 10, what, uh, zero being terrible and 10 being the best year you've ever had when it comes uh, from investments and you can't use a seven or a decimal point, <laughs> what would you give your year out of 10? I feel like every time you ask me these questions, I like never give you a straight answer and I try and justify never. the answer. You I'm could see give. even now, like you're just using words that aren't <laughs> saying a number. <laughs> This is, I feel like it's on brand now. Uh, no, I'm giving myself a 6 out of 10. I would have preferred a 7, but I'm giving myself a 6 out of 10 because I couldn't have a 7. That was, that was it. Why? Ah, so, oh, there we go. Now I get to explain. <laughs> so, so. Actually, I'm going to pause it right there. Most people that feel the need to say something before they give a number is right. They're trying to like justify the score or like hedge around it. <laughs> Totally, totally. I'm gonna tell. I'm gonna sell you the story of why it was a six. All right, give me the so, story. All right, cool. In previous years, when it's come to reviewing my investing, I have given it an eight out of ten. Now, as a mode of comparison, this year, this calendar year was just not as good. So I couldn't give it an eight because I'm like, I've had other years where I've had a better outcome. I've, produce more income or whatever I'm going for at the particular year. This year just wasn't that year. Now I thought I did quite well, so I wanted a seven, but now I can't use a seven. So I'm like, well, I can't bump it up to an eight. So it's a six. Okay. And when you're giving your score here, are you doing it purely from like, okay, this is a performance review, like if your net wealth went up or is you tackling this from like how you personally performed when it came to investing in wealth? Good question. So it's a bit of a split between both. So – I think the greatest feedback that we get as business owners and in our investing is the money that you have made, whether it's the cash flow or whether it's an increase in asset value. I don't care too much. It's more yeah, that the is score the still feedback. counts, right? Totally. But then your skill is the one that increases that along the way. So it's more of a bit of a split, but I lean heavier towards the dollars than I do my ability to deliver. And I think it would probably like a 60 40, if I was to say 60% dollars, 40% my, my own skill. What about you? What would you rate yourself? Come on. Is it going to be a one or a 10? I know you. I was trying to think of words to say before I give my number down. <laughs> just so I- <laughs> See, now you're trying to stall. <laughs> See, there we go. I did it. Nailed it. I'm actually going to go an eight. This was an, an eight year for me. Now, I'm probably the opposite to you though because like last year I definitely had a bigger win numerically. Like my net wealth went up more last year than it did this year, noting it still went up even in a difficult environment. But I would say on a more personal front, Bianca and I have really leveled up when it comes to managing our wealth and how we approach things. And right. giving it a six or less just wouldn't be justified. We are stronger financial managers today than we've ever been. And I'll, I'll use a quick analogy here, noting we've got a ton of things to go into, is I think if any business owner looks at the way they managed their business the first year they were in business, you probably accept you didn't do the greatest job versus what you do when you're like five years in. Like you just understand business much more deeply. So for us, it's like we've been investing for quite a number of years now. So our ability and understanding of investing and wealth has just leveled up so much that we feel like we're really like applying a lot of the things at a deeper level now. Like we're really yep. stronger in that department and uh, navigated some pretty tricky things, which we'll dig into uh, later within this. So uh, we'll go through these questions and we'll do a bit of a back and forth here. I feel like this would be a fun way to do it. So Grant, 
What were your goals in 2022? And I guess, did you achieve them? Good question. So one of my biggest goals wait, wait, wait. That I had. Of course, it's a fucking good question, Mike. <laughs> we came up with the questions. <laughs> wait, have you ever seen a guy try and stall whilst he's prepping his, his mental notes? What is it to stall? You've seen the questions. I, I feel as though that was better than saying um or a pause. <laughs> It was like it was like there was. Anyway, let's let's kill my ability to do public speaking later, Charlie. I have offered you a massive stall here, so you better have this. <laughs> All right. So, the goal for the year was I wanted to buy four investment properties. That's what Hazel and I set out to achieve, and that was like the number one of hell or high water. Let's go and buy like basically a property a quarter is what we were going for, um, and then we had the sort of the north star as like the second goal of we're trying to hit $120,000 in cash flow, net cash flow every single year. Now, obviously we won't get there with the properties that we got and that's what we're trying to work towards. So it's like, how can we just push closer to that through four properties, right? And just going harder and faster. All right, so just to uh, recap that is like your bigger goal, not to be done in a single year, but to be done across a few is that you want a $120,000 a year in passive income net to come from your property portfolio uh, in this case. So that's what you're working yep. towards when you acquire a property, you want to get towards that. But then the other side of that is the more tangible ones of the year were like, we wanted to get four properties in the year, one a quarter, which I will say that it's pretty ambitious. It's an ambitious Very goal amb- in itself. <clears throat> did you ambitious. hit the four? We did not. Uh, we hit two, and the two were at the start of the year. So it's, it started off great, and then you and I will talk about wine later on in this episode. But, yeah, we, we picked up the two, and then the last half of the year, we did not. All right, so two out of the four. Still, I mean, progress made. We'd have to give it that. Can, can I ask, did you uh, make a gain in this year? Like did your net worth go up this year, or did you take uh, potentially a loss, noting the markets have been a bit wild? So we were very fortunate because we bought at the start of the year, we actually got an increase and because our buyer's agent did very well in what they bought anyway, they were like under market value. So for the net of the year, we are actually still up on the start of the year. Um, and what what about everything there. in prior years? Like overall, are you up? Overall, we're still up. Overall, we're still up. The best thing about it as well is putting cash in the offsets because that's just helping offset. Uh, any potential increases or any increases, I should say, in interest rates. So a little bit of a wind there from a cash flow perspective, but also a capital growth perspective, we're still up. Albeit I haven't requested a a valuation in the last like three, four months, Charlie, deliberately, because I don't really want to say it. (laughs) So I'm like, like, if it's not there, it doesn't exist. But last time I checked, yes, we're still up. I'm curious. What about you? What were your goals for 2022? Yeah, so I wanted to acquire one more property. So I must admit, after the, what would I call it, buying frenzy we went on in previous years. That's the best way to put it. (laughs) Yes. Yeah, so I mean, buying, I think we did eight in 15 months was like the amount of properties we bought, like in in a span. What, uh, as much as I'm very proud of that, it actually took a lot out of Bianca and I to do it. Uh, to go through that, the amount of financing, the amount of conveyances, the amount of pest and building, like all the work and dealing with all of that was quite draining, especially with a, a uh, with a jack, a, a young toddler. <laughs> okay. With a jack. Brilliant. Yep. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, absolutely. It's like if you've got a settlement date at the exact same time your toddler is sick, like good luck with that. Not not the greatest. Or buying but a house to the point of that. Newborn. Yeah, we really wanted the portfolio to consolidate a little bit and then just slow down the acquisition thing so we could do a a bit of cleanup in this year and I guess not be so active in property. So we did absolutely make an acquisition, which was great. So we hit that one from there and then we did a lot of the cleanup, which I'll share more about the wins in the next part of uh, this there. But like I would like to uh, say we achieved majority of the goals we had right from a financial perspective. Net worth was up for the year. I was actually pretty surprised. I had some valuations recently done on our properties expecting <laughs> could I expect it? Not expecting a good <laughs> result, I'll be honest. I expected to see down on multiple and just didn't get that at all, which was surprising when you look that Melbourne and Sydney have taken such a big hit. Yeah, so were they up 
or sort of um, kind of net net of what they previously were? Like, were you s- kind of shocked as to where they were? Right. So th- the general context was that w- what I actually should say, my expectation was I expected the actual portfolio to be down about 10%. Yep. It was my like view of going, okay, with what's going on, that would kind of make sense. Um, when we got the individual properties themselves, two of them were like up more than 10%. Like it was actually really surprising. So they didn't just have like good years, they had great years. So the average Mm. growth rate in Australia is 6.1%, I think is the average over the last 30 years. Call it six, right? But to have two properties in the portfolio when markets have actually fallen across the year go up more than 10%, I was like, wow. And those gains on those two properties actually lifted the whole portfolio value quite substantially. Now, notably, we had some other ones that were still up quite a bit as well, like not over 10%, but like some threes and fours, and then just a couple of flat uh, ones in itself and then one property down uh, a little bit, which was not surprised. It'd be somewhere, which is more of a like Melbourne area one. Yeah, especially when you start looking across like the size of the portfolio to have the statistics that where it's only like one of them <laughs> has actually taken a minor hit. Man, especially in this environment, it's almost like – just net, net, zero, like no change is almost a good thing. It's almost a win of just going, oh, whew, touch that bullet. I would have been happy with a flat year. If we were yeah, coming totally. in here and I was like, all right, cool, we, we didn't go backwards, flat I would year. have called that a win. But to have made ground forward, um, and, and I will share something on this, is like I just continually get reminded that it's like even if there is a recession, I don't have to have a recession. There can be a down year and I can still do great. Don't one of the things that I like um, that, that you articulated that I think is really important, even for myself as a good reminder, is where previous years you've had very aggressive goals, but then you've had a, another like a year that you've just had, which has probably been less advantageous. Your goals have still taken a lot of work, like you and Bianca being the Harlem Globe, Globetrotter team. Of, hey, let's go and do some refinancing. Let's go and do some improvements. Let's go and do other things within the portfolio. I think that's I think that is a great message, even to sort of myself and to everyone else. Is like you can have very aggressive goals that you can push towards, but then you can also have some other years of like consolidation. Whereas like the goal is like, hey, let's just clean this thing up. Like I'm, I'm like, well, don't you feel like it's yeah, like business though? Like when you're in that startup phase of a business, like in general, and I say in general, like nothing really matters more than when you're in startup phase than marketing and sales. Completely, right? the goal needs to be like sell something. And then yep. when you move into the deeper years and you're, you're in that acceleration stage, well, then the goals change from sell something to like hire the people. So like it shifts as you move through the journey and the requirements from there. So managing a property portfolio when you've got one property isn't that hard. It's one property. But when you've got, um, I think we're at 11 or something now, it's like, and we've got 16 tenants or maybe 17, is like, the amount of work that goes into liaising all that has increased dramatically, so our goals had to as well. And I'm actually okay. going to jump questions and keep answering this one just because it fits in with this point from here. So the three biggest wins I would put across the portfolio for us is one you kind of touched on there is like a big goal we had for this year was actually to refinance the poor property portfolio. I butchered that. Just need a little <laughs> sip here. <laughs> So we'll go into the three wins here, but like the the wins I see across our year from an investing point of view is like, number one is we got a massive refinance done. So I don't mean just like fixing up like one loan, all of them. We refinanced every property we had, which was a substantial amount of work. And the reason for that is because we actually got some loans that weren't, were only suitable to acquire the property. They weren't actually good loans to take on or mortgages to take on to maintain the properties. So I think at times if you're going to get aggressive like we did is you might get a loan with the bank just because you know you can get the finance, but then you'll refinance to another better deal uh, down the road when it's a suitable timing to do so. So we did a massive one of them uh, pretty early in the year that went well. Um, goal number two, like thing I'm, I'm really happy that we did was we acquired another property. So uh, we Sorry. did make one more purchase in WA across this year. Noting the year's not done yet, Grant, so I'm, I'm cautious <laughs> in putting this in here and saying one acquisition. I am a little bit itchy. Um, Is it if you sign the, the next contract, one saying, does that count? If the contract signed, does that count? Or do you have to take keys? I think we'll have to do settlement. I have to do a based on <laughs> settlement. So that, it may be my only acquisition for the year. But we'll see. We'll see. The year is not done. 
Um, and then the third one I was going to say is just the management system. Like Bianca <sighs> and I have really leveled up in that area. And I want to go more deeply into what that means is like our reporting is now like absolutely spot on. I love yep. how we get the reports. And every time I get a monthly report, Bianca makes a, a Loom video going through the report. We go through each property and like we know where everything's at and how it's performing at a really good level so we can make better decisions. So we can go, are we going to make a move here? How are interest rates affecting what's going on within our portfolio? Like I feel really in tune to the same level I do in my business where I haven't had that before at the same level where now it's like really on point. So they would be my three biggest wins and how it kind of comes together to shape this one up. So just to recap, win number one, refinancing. Win number two, huge one. making another acquisition. And then win number three is definitely the management system. The investing management system probably even might have to be my biggest one in there. Now I'll flip this one though, Grant. What were your three biggest wins of the year? I will have to say, like, the management system is so underrated. <laughs> like, you know how you did that rating system before? I'm like, that is that is one of those underrated things. Um, so my biggest win, first one, was the two properties, right? So I bought them in, I think it was January and it's either March or May. I can't remember which ones or where it was, but I think it might have been May. Um, just so it starts just, to blur together when you get that bigger it portfolio, is it? It's like <laughs> there's, so, there's so many. No, it was. Uh, and why, Which states were these in again? Did we buy them here? Or this? <laughs> it's, it's interesting. Like, um, and I always come back to it. It's like, like I know you and I joke about it because like, oh, it's just another house. It's just another house. But when someone's starting their journey, it's like this massive, hey, I'm, I'm buying a house. I haven't done this before. What I'm doing, all those kind of things. And so every time I reflect back on it at this time of year, I'm just like, wow, like the amount of time, effort, capital that goes into buying a property. I'm like, if, if you don't even, if, like if you get one, like celebrate the hell out of it. Like if you did something that you did, which was a stupid amount <laughs> within a year and a bit period, it's like, oh my gosh. So for us, that was one of our big wins because we're like, great, like we have now leveled it up. Um, I wish that we kept going, but for the points that we're going to talk about uh, fairly soon, um, we kind of didn't, but it's still one of the biggest wins because it's comparative to us getting one or none. I'm, I'm ecstatic and they have done very well and I, I really like those houses. Which, by the way, congratulations. Before you jump to that though, I, I wonder if we could get your perspective on this. I found for myself like the first property you buy is like the first employee you hire in your business. Totally. But it's like it's a big deal. But um, when you've been doing it for a while and like even now I think we've got about 40 people in the media company where it's like it doesn't give you the same thrill and you become way more comfortable with it. So with totally. property, like as you've started to make um, more acquisitions and you become more comfortable with it, it seems to be like it doesn't uh, take as much to overcome each purchase. Did you find that? Totally, totally. But it's also like – the mountain to get into another purchase is not as high. Uh, the time investment is not as great. Like you're doing a process that you now understand and know. Whereas like previously I'm like, oh, is there any other documents? Is there anything else? Like what do I need to sign? Like now it's just collate it all, get it signed and, and like it's done. Like it's not, it is not something that we're like, oh, what's next? Have we got everything? Have we missed stuff? Hey, um, what else should we be looking out for? Like it's, yeah, it's much more of a smoother process now. The second one that I've got is actually one that it's funny. Every time that you and I talk about it, I always think of it as business, but it's really like investing. So in a previous podcast episode, uh, we were talking about when I exited um, a service officer's business. So during the year, like that was all done and dusted. All the payouts were completed. Like everything was was done. And we did it actually an entire episode on it. Um, so I was very pleased with that as an outcome. But in addition to that, I actually just sold equity in another business um, that was started about a year and a half, two years ago that I helped them set it up and I haven't done too much since. Um, and so that was a seven figure exit on their half. And I just had a couple of percent equity in that as well. So had a very fortunate second exit of another business that I had equity in. So I was- See, I, was I absolutely happy. count that. That's investing. You had invest, I know you may have put some time into it and it was a business technically. But if you look that you made an exit and were able to get a capital return, like I think it's investing more than it would be uh, business, if anything. And I think this is huge, right? Because I don't know many people that actually get the 
opportunity or even see through to success actually selling a company for like seeing cash, like turning it into something. <laughs> totally. Um, and it, it's really interesting. Like the, the bigger win for me on this is focus. Like focus in the sense of not having as many things operate. Um, as you, you know me, Charlie, uh, I, <laughs> I invest. Anyone who comes to me with a good business idea, I'm like, I'm sure you can have some time, some time and some money. No worries at all. Like, let's go and do this thing. <laughs> and uh, over the last sort of probably, I'll call it a year and a half, two years, it's been really a sort of a consolidation thing just so I can focus in on less things to a higher level of quality. And so the win, yes, there was good money to be made out of it. But the bigger win for me was just actually the consolidation down into actually being able to focus on just a few things. So now I've looked at all of these other investments that I've got and saying, hey, like how can I ex exit my positions in these? Um, who wants the equity? What would you pay for the equity and all those kind of things? So this one was like one of the more final ones that I've got. Like I don't have too much else outside of companies that I've personally started and been involved in. And so this is almost like a stamp of going, wow, like that part of the journey is like completed. Like this is now focused on. Do you find the deeper you go into business and investing, um, and I mean this in both camps, is like there's a refinement? So I feel like when you're younger, you're more exploratory where you you know, you know might try startups or you might try, uh, I don't know, investing in a certain type of asset class and you end up with a mix of things. But as you kind of work out what suits you, what's right for your circumstance, you kind of start to peel away things. So like certain investments that I would have taken in my 20s, I won't even look at now because I'm just totally. like, all right, that, that's not my flavor. Like I, I know when I go to the ice cream aisle, I know where I'm going, right? I, I know what my flavor is. <laughs> exactly. And so I actually found it out on the, the side of like where can I add the most leverage to businesses and what type of businesses can I add the most leverage to? And these two that I got out of, I, I just can't add that much leverage to them outside of them just requesting more of my time for me to figure out how to run a new business model, for me to figure out how to deliver into a new industry. And I'm like – that's a massive thing for me to learn to help them grow. So I'm like, it's just easier for me to sort of get off the train and let them continue on. Um, and then I'll, I'll make some money on the way out, which is awesome and high fives. But the better thing for me to do so that I don't hold that train back is just to get off and then they can just continue running. And so that's kind of the position that I've seen on both of these that have closed out in the last 12 months. Absolutely. Plus the opportunity cost. If you've got capital tied up in that uh opportunity there and let's say you can get a couple of percent return on that capital per year if you can take that out and put it into something that you're enjoying more gives you focus and offers a higher return that's compound wins totally totally uh and then uh, there was a win that i was wanting to include in here charlie which was like uh you and i we've covered it on an episode where i've got like a quarter of a million dollars lent out to another business and i'm like trying to get them to start paying it back but i haven't been able to hit that in this year i think it's going to be on the next year as well but so my third wait, 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 one, how, did, was, how did that make it to the win section then i feel like that, that should was be, be a challenges <laughs> section <laughs> that was it was because i was i was hoping that i was i was trying to close out in the last week or something but the third one uh which is kind of similar to your your point is so hazel's actually taken the entire portfolio property on herself um now i, I do support her in it but it was just a huge win to see her just run like a million miles a minute at our property portfolio so she's now like becoming this well organized google sheets everywhere communicating to property managers like just her sort of dipping the toe and and absorbing that was a great win i think we're a little bit behind where you and bianca are in the harlem globe trotters of just you know where a ball's gonna get thrown and she's just like dunking it in the ring we're getting towards that but it was a great step one of being able to sort of see my wife step even more into sort of our personal net wealth and sort of making sure she can propel that it was actually a that one was more of a looking at the win of saying this is just going to be a force to be reckoned with on her and I just punching forwards. So, and she really sort of stepped into that during the last 12 months. So I was very happy with that. That's huge. Absolutely huge. Um, quick funny story here. When I actually met Bianca, um, she worked uh, for Centro Shopping Centres. Now, I actually thought she was a checkout chick at like a Centro Shopping Centres. I'm like, all right, cool. Like young and naive, I didn't realize she was actually like in the finance department and was an accountant. I'm like, okay, she's an accountant, but she's like working with the checkout. Um, how lucky, I might have to check, there must be some Irish in me here because there's a bit of like luck of like how beneficial it's been to have a partner that's an accountant across the journey. 
instrumental. Totally. totally is. But to your point, one of the things I've found for myself, and I, I would love to get your perspective on this as well, is that building welts almost become a hobby for Bianca and I. It's not just us building a future for our family and being financially independent and secure. It's like things we talk about. It's like we're interested in building wealth and we enjoy that game and it's an activity we do together. Has that started to occur for you and Hazel? And I guess even further to that, I suspect many people who listen to this show would love to have their partners more involved. Like, do you think totally. it's been beneficial on that front as well? Yeah, so I've, I've learned a lot through it. So the first one is that she's definitely more frugal than I am when it comes to property repairs. <laughs> I thought I thought I'd make sure that it was. So is, it like, is it like duct tape on the walls and shit? <laughs> it's, like, it's a hole in the wall. It's like, what do you mean we have to fix that? Like, surely someone will just. It's put extra a storage. <laughs> but she's, she's still like covered there, um, which has actually been really good because she's got a, a completely different viewpoint to myself. Where for me, it's more of a convenience, just tick a box. Yeah, no worries. I'll fix it, fix it, fix it, fix it. Where she's like, hey, like this thing needs to be profitable. So I would actually argue that's like the right person on the right seat on the bus <laughs> so where I'm just like, whatever, man, just get it done. Stop talking to me. Um, but the other thing that I like is that there's someone else for me to sort of push forwards with right outside of you, Charlie, where like we lean on each other and challenge each other on a lot of things. It's actually really good to have someone in the house where it's like, hey, like, what are we doing next? Where's the next one coming from? Hey, this is what I've learned. Could we apply something like this? Or, hey, I went and talked to a friend and this was their how they're approaching like property managers. So like uh, actually she, uh, Hazel spoke to Bianca and Bianca's got property managers paying invoices and she's like, we can totally do the same thing, right? And so I'm like, ah, oh, so now it's not just sort of on one person with sort of support. Now it's two people running the same direction. And that was just, it was as much of a win for her to find something she enjoys that also helps us out um, as it was like a thing of beauty of just going fantastic. Now we're both on the same journey together. And she's actually taken this full ownership over. Like I, I was ecstatic. And no, she's not an accountant. <laughs> I, wish I don't think maybe. that's a requirement either. It can be it handy, a, life, but a life hack. <laughs> completely. I think it brings alignment. I think many business owners would uh, love to have their partner involved in their business in some way so that they can be more aligned or on that journey together where that may not be appropriate. But on the wealth side, I think it potentially is. And like I've enjoyed it a lot. It sounds like you're enjoying it a lot. Might be a goal for people out there in their uh, next 2023 where they might do the same. Totally, totally. They were, they, they were my key wins. I'm curious, Charlie. Through, I'm going to ask you the question this time. <laughs> through the year, what were some of the top challenges that you faced? No, everything went perfect, Grant. Like I'm flawless. <laughs> It was just 2022. What a magical year! There was everything happened as we expected. I like I had a crystal ball and it was perfect. No, this wow. year was hard, right? If you if you had to look at this purely from an in investing perspective, right? Um, last year or even the year before that, it was actually relatively easy to get a lot of things done. Markets were booming. Yes, it had its challenges for different reasons. But on a performance basis, much easier to get results than this year. Um, the notable ones that I'll mention here was like obviously uh, geopolitic related things like and then that leading to inflation and interest rates like played a massive factor, massive factor. Huge. I have a large amount of debt and when interest rate moves, we notice like it is substantial in our lives. Um, the other one that was really, I suppose, a huge challenge for us on the investing front is that Queensland made some changes to its land tax uh, and how it was going about that. And it's pretty much like they were targeting us. It's pretty much like someone's like, who, who's Charlie, Bianca. Charlie and Bianca and how can we hit them <laughs> overwhelmingly hard? So for us, <laughs> when I think of the investing front, where we were particularly challenged was interest rates land tax changes and it really made me think about what we're doing in a different way because I had looked at this and gone we're pretty well protected where we've got some buffers but I never could have predicted these things to happen like I realized that you really have to accept that anything can happen mm. like you just don't know what's going to be coming at you and you may feel like you're taking appropriate uh, risk measures but even then you may not 
And I, I would be lying that uh, if I said right now that it, like when the Queensland land tax thing was particularly going on, there was a bit of stress in the home. We thought we were going to have to move some of our Queensland properties into uh, individual trusts yep. to try and mitigate against some of this. And we were potentially looking at about, I think it was going to cost us about $50,000 to manoeuvre the portfolio to do that. And that would have been an unexpected hit. Now, luckily, we would have had the cash to do so. And I will note that those Queensland land taxes have since changed. But I just never considered, like, government risk in this case. Mm. Yeah. I found everything that you reflected on, which was, like, the sort of the geopolitical conflict, inflation, interest rates, same for myself. Like, one of the challenges that I had was – I don't know if you'd put it down to knowledge or sort of uh, experience or anything like that, was actually knowing how to react to one of those environments. Like I look at every situation, I go, every situation people will win. In uh, a down market, there will always be people who are winning, if, whether they short stock or do whatever they do. There's always Liquidation companies. <laughs> exactly. Liquidation companies doing great. Um, and I just looked at it and I'm like, I – I realized that I'm not as strong at playing this game, albeit I, I know what to look for and I roughly know how to kind of play it. But I'm really strong at playing the previous game that we were at when it was like super low interest rates, like super low inflation, all those kind of things. And so now it's like, okay, well, how do I play in this environment? And so one of the challenges that I had was I just never witnessed it before. And that's why when I, when I gave my score a 6 out of 10, that was one of the things that I'm just like, well, did I play it right and the way I would articulate that is every year that you have reviewed how well you have done, imagine it was the last five years and you're like, from an investing perspective, how well have I done? And you probably gave yourself an eight out of 10 last year, maybe. And then this year you look back and you'd be like, wow, there was so much I didn't know in that year. I, now I would rate myself a six out of 10. But at the time with the information I knew and the knowledge I had, definitely understood why I gave myself an eight out of 10. Right, it's just because you learnt more, have seen more, and now know how to play situations better, right? And it's only because you got the benefit of hindsight. And I've kind of looked at this year as kind of being two years in one. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, the first half I did great, but the second half I found a big challenge for myself was like, how do I perfectly play it? And not perfectly, like how do I play it well enough where I'm looking back happy at how I have approached it and the returns that I've got from it. Well, I will go as far to say that the management system we have today wouldn't be this good if the challenges of the year didn't come. So like I listed this as one of my wins, right? So the wins come from it, which is really interesting. But why we had to level up our management is because, well, if you believe the RBA and rates weren't going up to t- till 2024, right, we didn't need to be as concerned about interest rates. Mm. Turns out there's a lesson in uh, – listening to the RBA, by the way, might leave that one there. <laughs> so like that change of environment forced us to develop better management systems. And it's like, it's interesting that challenges often lead to innovation, which can be really okay. powerful. So like when we've taken hits in business, they can end up being our strengths. Uh, the irony being, I only ever started a marketing company because I got screwed over by a marketer. <laughs> and I'm not having this happen again. So I'm going to learn this. So it's really fascinating that the challenges end up being the wins in the years after, which I think is really interesting. So Totally. But to your point, like if you look at the last three years, I feel like it was all the same game. So you knew the moves to make or the ways to act, where in the last 12 months, for example, or this year, as we haven't dealt with an interest rate uh, cycle going up or geopolit- uh, geopolitical uh, threats or inflation – I actually found uh, myself continually in indecision going, well, because this has happened, do I need to change my plan? Oh, what about now? And I did not enjoy the amount of time I spent in indecision or struggling to know, well, is the RBA the source of truth? Can Can they really be trusted? Should we be selling a property because of this? Or maybe we should be buying a property because of this. So it opened up a whole different um dialogue in the house and when I say in the house between Bianca and I that I would not have expected to happen because of these challenges and you actually hit on my second challenge so my first one was the challenge around like knowledge and experience around how do I play this my second one was what I'm what I've defined as my reaction 
to it. Like, am I am I happy with the reaction that I had where the way that Hazel and I played it was we just basically retracted. We said, cool, retract, go hard on business and just make as much cash flow as possible and we'll just figure ourselves out. As uh, Basically, it's like oh, ret- pa- pause retract there. and evaluate. Well done, by the way. We did pretty well in business, not to spoil <laughs> the next episode, but it's been a great year in business, the irony. <laughs> So maybe well, we the, needed these challenges in investing to go time to, to go, make some cash. <laughs> to go harder in business. But, and so for me, one of my challenges was the knee-jerk reaction because it's like how difficult is it when everything around you is saying prices are going up, uh, sorry, yeah, uh, prices are going down, uh, interest rates are going up, inflation is going up, like, oh, let's go and buy another property. Like intuitively to someone who has never faced that situation, like my immediate reaction is like, bullshit. <laughs> Like, no. Like, what, so what do I Your think? investor psychology may not have been where you thought it was then. Did you think so you the, were mentally stronger as an investor and then when the environment occurred, you go, oh, shit, I'm not? What? So my knee-jerk reaction was, like, if we were looking to buy a house at that time, I probably would have hit pause on it just to get a, a rough lay of the land for myself, go and look at my own data and make my own opinion outside of what other people are trying to push down my throat. I was more looking at it, my reaction on going, why did I have that knee-jerk reaction? It's like in the story where you've shared previously when you saw it, when you were invested in a company and then you saw a negative news story, you're like, sell. <laughs> like it's like, get me out. And that was like the, the first knee-jerk reaction was just like- You're talking about my epic success as a day trader. Correct. That was me shooting shots. Hope you enjoyed it. <laughs> uh, but And so my knee-jerk reaction was like, no. And I'm a- I'm a very strategical thinker, so I will retract and reevaluate before I go again next. Where some of the best wins that we've had is when my reaction to that scenario is immediate. So it's like I know what's going to happen. I know how to play this. Let's go straight for it. Like you know, like that fight or flight. And I was like, it's like a fight or reflect. <laughs> it's like, do, what do I do in this situation? And then like, and that was only quite short for us. And then it was like, great, let's go harder in business, make money because I have no idea what's going to happen to the economy even then over the next six, 12 months. I've got ideas, but again, I, my ideas aren't always going to be right. It's the uncertainty, right? right? The uncertainty <laughs> makes it a very interesting dynamic. And so then the decision was, well, let's focus on earning and if we miss out on a good buying opportunity, we will accept that. And so, and uh, I'm just going to have to wear that risk of just not going hard during the current environment. Um, But that was like our knee-jerk reaction was like, wait, retract. And then we made the decision of like, let's hold off. And so for me, like that was a big challenge for someone who just loves having his foot hard down on the accelerator. (laughs) I was just like, and go, because you know how to play most situations. Like any situation in business, I'm pretty good at it because I've seen most of them. But in this environment, I'm like, oi, how do I react? And so I found that as a big challenge was my second one was like my reaction. Like it's like, how do you react to this straight out? I'll share an interesting insight. Um, I actually felt I had a pretty strong investor psychology before coming into this year. So if you go right at the start of 22, how would you have rated it? Because it's something I've done a bit of work on through the share trading experience, through personal development work. I have discovered across this year though what – uh, has changed for me is having something to lose. Like oh, when I, huge. my, yeah, it's easy to have a strong investor psychology if you've only got a hundred bucks in the bank, like it's, or maybe not for other reasons, but if you've only got a hundred dollars to lose in this example, it's easier to deal with where it's like my property portfolio is multiple millions. Now the idea of that's now what's on the table brought a whole new level of seriousness to it. So I was not expecting that to come up um, where it's something I've had to do more work on across the year. Yeah, where it's almost like being comfortable with sort of steadying the ship and reflecting as opposed to always needing to have the gas down. Um, so that, that Definitely was, that, put a different value on sleep at night factor. <laughs> so, totally. And I don't think people have yeah, – innately as a business owner – all I care about is like gusto, like hustle hard, hustle fast. Let's go at this thing. And in investing, like that was, again, my one of my challenges was that reaction to knowledge and experience. It was just like, <laughs> are you going to be okay not touching shit? Like, hey, Grant, the way that you're going to do well in here, don't touch anything. 
<laughs> just just accumulate stuff. And you do good. And my brain's like, what the fuck do you mean? Don't touch anything. <laughs> I'm just like, no, you should probably touch it. Do I have a question for you though, Charlie? Lay down. Biggest lesson that you took away from the year? Anything can happen. Ooh, that's a good one. Yeah, I, I would have to say, and I'll put some bounds around this, the thing that I caught myself on the most was I was making too many assumptions and treating them as facts. All right, so I was like, well, interest rate, and this is just an example, interest rates won't go up. But that's an assumption. Like that's me actually having an opinion on the environment and then uh, having risk in the market based on that. Where it's yeah. like, turns out they can go up. Um, and the one that I would say, and I, I don't necessarily love talking about this topic, but it's like I never thought that a potential conflict between countries could break out. I kind of mm. thought we were past that as a society. And I, when I reflected, I was like, well, that was pretty ignorant. Like there's t- continual tensions. Um, and then the land tax thing, to think that governments can't make changes to policies and taxes. So there's so many areas where I had blind spots and just was like assuming those things wouldn't change and putting uh, investments at risk against that blindly. So I really look at this and go, having a more open-mindedness to you just don't know what can happen and adjusting risk accordingly, absolutely my biggest lesson of the year when it comes to investing. Things things can change. What is it? The only thing in life that's, that's constant is change. <laughs> it's like, hey, it's not always going to be the same. It was, it was interesting. Uh, the way that I think about mine as my biggest lesson was have you ever – looked at i don't know maybe car insurance right and like every year you're like cool my parents told me to go get car insurance and it's the right thing to do is insure my car and then over 10 years you're like man i never use this car insurance i've spent fortune on this car insurance and then you run into someone and like whoo hey gosh i had car insurance (laughs) and it revalidated why you had this risk mitigation in play that was it for me was the revalidation on an idea and a concept that a lot of people have been challenging and trying to challenge me on, which is conservativeness. And I know that Charlie, you're more like risk adverse and conservative than I am, especially with your size portfolio. Me looking at going back at this year and saying, holy smokes, am I ecstatic that I had, I was putting minimum 20% deposit down on every house. I had insurance on it. I had emergency buffers, not just personally, but in every single property because this massive impact that's happened to this ha- everyone has received or most people have received, I'm like, we've just skipped it. Like it just hasn't impacted me because I'm like, I look at it as now these things will exist in our portfolio for a very long period of time and actually be able to compound over the next 20, 30, 40, 50 years as opposed to me risking having a look going, what am I going to sell? What do I need to offset? What do I need to... How do I take something from the business to go and put into it? So for me, the biggest lesson was, it was not so much a lesson, it was just a revalidation is what I called it, of just saying, hey, like this risk mitigation thing and emergency buffer thing, like everybody's sitting there going, lever up, get more debt, inflate away debt, do all these things. And I'm like, resisted it. I'm like, Grant, you're doing the right thing. And that was the right plan. And into the future for the next couple of decades, I think I'll remember this situation to validate all of my risk mitigation and the large deposits and the emergency funds and everything because it's like you just don't know what's going to happen. I, I will admit I have been a little bit smug this year. I cop some <laughs> flack about our episode and how much cash reserves I, I keep and like how well buffered I am, but I, I've been sticking my nose up at people continually across the year because of it. No, not at all. But, do, but don't you find that um, – you have a different appreciation for those people that don't get greedy in the boom times. You look at it and go, oh, you're actually the sage. That complete. It's fun. All of the stories that I read about, it's like the person that didn't wipe out is the one that wins. And the person that you read about in the newspaper that's like had this massive win that you never hear about again are the ones that wiped out later because they just took too much risk. They had a massive win and then they lost. <laughs> and you just, oh, okay, that's not how you should play this game. The thought did cross my mind at the start of the year and maybe a little bit before that is like why are we slowing down with property? Like we should go way harder. We should we should do another 10 across this year. And I look at what it would have happened if we did that and I go, wow, 
like that would have potentially been a wipe out of it. Maybe not, but it's like I look at it and go, I appreciate risk very, very differently. And you can imagine totally. like, oh, yeah, and I'll, I'll bet there's some people out there today hurting because they're over levered or were too bullish and it's like the sustainability game is the one to play. Like you don't want to – the risk of wipeout events is just too high for people. All yeah. right, well, moving on. Last question on this uh, for our panel, and I've enjoyed this back and forth, Grant. I think this is really interesting to unpack some of the reflections of the year. Would you do anything differently? Yes. <laughs> Dude, hindsight is a killer. Wait, wait. Uh, you actually answered the question. You didn't stall straight out of the things. gates. I had nice. to. I was like punching myself under the table, just going, just answer the question. Damn it. Uh, totally. There are two two things which I find comical now, right? And and they should be comical because, again, like you know, I can't change anything and it, it is what it is. Two things that I would have done differently. Uh, one, I would have sold my crypto at the start of the year. <laughs> <laughs> Nice. Which I'm, I'm, dude, I'm fine with it. Like, it, do we it have to do a is. podcast episode? Is crypto now dead? Like, is this <laughs> over? Anyway, we'll come back to that at another point. Um, so, so that was one. But again, like, I'm, I'm not trying to defend my position, but I'm like, I'm for it. It's completely speculative. Like, whatever happens, happens. Like, no worries at all. Like, it would be more my greed saying, like, I needed to sell this thing than anything else. Uh, and the second one, which is like, imagine I had a, like this magic wand, Charlie, of like, ooh, and that is going to be the second that a high inflation print's going to come out. <laughs> At the start of the year, I would have gone hard for like three, four, five months and just bought as much property as possible and just let that thing ride. Interesting. And I'm talking like probably Q, Q1, I would have gone hard. Um, and it's more because of the borrowing capacity. And I think that, um, and it sounds like you're in a very similar position. Like the, the properties that we've got are in positions that have actually done, like in, in suburbs, I should say, that have actually done quite well, notwithstanding like what even what's happened recently. And I'm like, oh, okay, cool. Like if I had have just levered up and then just focus in on the business on the other side, I actually think that would have been a, a decent play. Now, would I have bought the four within like three months? No, I'm more the same. Like I probably would have preferred to buy one more right back at the start of the year. I feel like this is like a market timing answer though. If you had done that, if you'd have loaded up in Q1 and then the rest of the year had unfolded the way it did, I think you would have been stressed as balls. I think that we wouldn't even be doing this podcast right now. You just, hair would be gone. <laughs> but that was what I'm like. That's what I'm like. If I had this magic wand of like, poof, now I know which suburb, uh, now I know or, or like township, now I know which place, like, sure. But again, that's me being so tongue in cheek. It's crazy where like I have no ability to do that. Um, but yeah, and there was a third one that I put on here, which is a smaller one. So we did uh, like a $35,000 renovation to one of our properties uh, in, I think it was like Q1, it finished in Q2 this year. And I would not have done that. I don't think it, it has increased our rent and all those kind of things. But I think that actually having the cash in our bank account and stuff like that now would have been a better thing. And yes, for anyone saying, sure, I can go and refinance and kind of get the money out and all those things. But no, I just think that that liquid cash, especially, especially knowing that this whole event was going to happen, to use that money for whatever opportunity is going to show its head over the next one month, six months, 12 months, whatever, I think I would be happier with than actually doing the renovation. But again, hindsight, hindsight. It's you could almost put that in our lessons learned, right? The value of cash. Like, don't you feel differently what? towards cash? Like, I was very much of the view in years prior that it's like, well, cash is just in, inflating away. You've got to make sure you don't have too much in cash because of its value decrease. And that's probably even more true in a time of higher inflation, which we're in now. But I think we forgot the part, which is like, cash is opportunity. Yes, it might be degrading in value, but your opportunity to seize heavily undervalued investments or pounce on things Massive. Liquidity was is huge. What about you? What would you do different? <laughs> I <Nothing>. actually <laughs> Yeah, that's my answer. <laughs> I think oh, as man. much as this year um did have things you could look at in the moment and, and do a market timing answer of going, Oh, do you know what? I wish yeah. I bought this property on this street because it would have boomed. I look at it and go, I think the environment made us better. Uh, what I'll call wealth business owners. Yeah. Yep. 
this year has had our skills become so much stronger. I've, I've learned so much. I've grown as an investor. And I think this year actually has set me up substantially to be much stronger in the next 10 years. And I think without it, the returns I'll get across the next 10 years will be substantially lower. And I also think that they potentially would have made me um, just more ignorant and stupid when it comes to investing. My risk would have potentially shifted where this has just reformed up a lot of things for me. I think, there's a, I think there's a lot to that is actually being able to reflect and look back at these as some of the greatest lessons, whether it was perfectly played or not. Like I, I tongue in cheek say like there, there was a perfect way to play this, which we obviously I did not know how to play it perfectly. And obviously the way that I played it is not perfect. But the ability to reflect and learn on it I think that is the best thing about it is it's almost like I got another year of seeing a completely different environment, a completely different way to play it and go, ooh, this is how I'm going to do it. This is how I'm not going to do it. I see that that is just a huge win through a pretty bleak situation or shitty situation. Yeah, massive. I'll tell you what, Grant, we might uh, wrap this one up from here. And I will mention to anyone listening to this episode who is on the email list let me know your biggest uh, lesson of the year or maybe your biggest win. Like if you've had anything happen across this year that um, you'd like to share, please do. I'd love to hear particularly the biggest lessons or what people would do differently. I'd love to know. And if you're sitting there going, I got no idea what Charlie is talking about, head, head over to businessandinvesting.com forward slash newsletter because then you put in your details and you'll be able to reply to those emails. So that is businessandinvesting.com forward slash newsletter. I just want to say thank you to everybody for joining us and we look forward to continue on the next episode of Business and Investing with myself and Charlie.